you will be asked to verbally respond if you would like. So um, let's see, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Linda. She, um, Linda uh, trained with the Folger Shakespeare Library and she is a retired teacher of English language arts and Shakespeare studies. She delighted in teaching Shakespeare's plays to the students at Cab Calloway School of the Arts in Wilmington for 21 years, where she was a founding Shakespeare performance teacher. Uh, Delaware's Student Shakespeare Festival has also benefited from her guidance for 25 years. She has received fellowships for the study of the plays of Shakespeare at a national um, the National Endowment of the Arts Seminar and at uh, Shakespeare's Globe in London. She earned a postgraduate diploma in Shakespeare and theater at the Shakespeare Institute Stratford-upon-Avon. She served as a text coach for Wilmington Drama League's all-female production of Macbeth and recently served as the text coach for the Arden Shakespeare Guild's production of Romeo and Juliet. We're extremely pleased that she's with us tonight here and to share some of her insights with us. Um, so I am going to spotlight Linda and unmute and mute myself. Um, and if you are you ready, Linda? I am. I have been told that I am ready. <laughs> yes, I have a technical assistant with me in the person of my firstborn grandchild, who is a senior at the University of Delaware. And as she has just said, has become an expert in Zooming over the last 18 months. The first thing that I would like to do this evening, actually, can Maddie, can we get back to that view that I can see everybody? There we go. This is something that I used to do with, with my students back in the classroom that is called a voting game. And here is how it goes. I will be asking some questions. If the answer for you is yes, show us all a thumbs up. If the answer for you is no, show us all a thumbs down. If you are undecided, you can, you can wiggle it. So the first question is, have you ever read as you like it. This is where if my thumb is not up, you get to pull the plug and say, go away and never speak to us again. Have you ever seen a live staged version of As You Like It? Have you ever seen a filmed version of As You Like It? <laughs> Have you ever acted in As You Like It? Have you ever directed As You Like It? Have you ever designed for As You Like It? Okay, well, that gives us a sense of, of where we all are with regard to um, this play. I have actually seen this play in, in live performance, including at least once on the green of, of Arden, um, <clears throat> but also uh, in professional performance, stage performance, um, probably more than any other play. My goal in this lifetime was to see every play that we think Shakespeare wrote live in performance by a, a professional company um, before I left this earth. And I would like to say that in 2014, I did that. So all of these extra years are now bonus years because I have met my lifetime goal. Um, watching Shakespeare's plays are one of the greatest pleasures in, in my life. 
I never tire of it. In fact, um, there were 15 of us American school teachers who got to study Shakespeare in performance with Jay Halligo, an emeritus professor of English retired from the University of Delaware through the National Endowment for the Humanities. And uh, we studied both in Newark as well as in Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, we got to see the entire season of the Royal Shakespeare Company that summer. And oh darn, sometimes we even had to go and see two performances in one day uh, um, with just a little bit of, of dinner in between. And um, it was with those people, um, with those 14 people and Jay, that I came to totally fall in love with the wonders of watching a, something unfold before your eyes in the same space with other human beings and then spending ridiculous amounts of time dissecting every last little bit of it after the play was over. We quickly discovered when we got back to our own homes and families that even the people who love us the very most in the world really do not want to talk about theater as much as we do. And so we have been meeting every other year <clears throat> someplace in North America to spend a week together. Um, now, not all 15 of us have come to any given one, but a goodly number of us go to each one. And we watch plays mostly by Shakespeare, but we do allow the occasional other play right into, into our purview. And then we stay up late and we talk about it. In 2019, we had a reunion in Stratford upon Avon. And as luck would have it, both the RSC and the Globe Theater had at Globe and the work I did at the Shape and ideas so much as they are biases at this point. The first being that what it is that you see on on a stage or in a in a playing space is first and foremost a story a story that is being enacted for you. Now, sometimes things are happening on the stage that really enhance your understanding of the story. I will give just one example. Early in the 2000s, I saw a production of King Lear at the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, DC. It was early in the play where the two older sisters had just said how much they love their father more than anybody, more than anything. And Lear turns to Cordelia and says, and what is it that you can say that will earn you a bigger half of, of the kingdom than your sisters? And Cordelia's line is nothing. This was the first time I had ever experienced total chills in the theater because the actor who was playing Cordelia was a deaf mute. And so she signed that line and what you heard was nothing. And to me, that was just a brilliant, casting choice that so informed the whole rest of the play for me. This is why Lear has special care for Cordelia in that production. Now, at the other end of the extreme is a choice that is made that, that to me, and I'm well aware that of course, this is all open to 
vast amounts of interpretation. I could not have been having all these discussions with all of my Shakespeare friends for all these years without being very, very much aware of that. This was also early in the 2000s. It was a production at the Globe. It was Macbeth. It, lots of interesting choices were made in this production. It was set in the 1920s. The jazz musicians were so outstanding at their craft that they kept um somebody needs to mute and i will look let's see bob i think it's you <laughs> okay okay Sorry. production of Macbeth. Um, musicians playing jazz music that was so outstanding that my focus kept being pulled away from the story and into the music. I think that is a problem. What was a bigger problem for me, however, with that production was when Lady Macbeth was doing her sleepwalking thing, she was doing so on a girder that was suspended by two chains above the stage and it was being this direction and then she would walk and it would go in this direction. My heart was in my throat in fear for the physical safety of that fellow human being and I was gone to the story. To me that those choices served as detriments to the telling of the story. If you are being pulled out of the story as an audience member, I would argue that that there's there's a problem, there's an issue because what should be happening is that the story is being told by a large variety of storytellers and and on on the very stage. So bias number one is that it's a story to be told that's unfolding before you and that hopefully the story is being enhanced by choices that are being made by directors, designers, actors, and not um, detracted from. The other um, bias that, that I, I got from my training at the Globe in 2001, and this was, um, was three weeks that was with the theater director from the Old Globe Theater in San Diego, California. And he was probably one of the meanest people I have ever known in my whole entire life. But he was a pretty good director and he had the following to say that it, that is just true. Um, Shakespeare's text, gives you everything you need to know. You, the director, you, the designer, especially you, the actor. Shakespeare's text gives you everything you need to know except why and how. And that. And that is why. Bob, we're having trouble because you keep unmuting and, and we can hear the television in the background or something like that. <laughs> okay. And that is why Shakespeare continues to be performed on such a relentless base, basis by groups of community members, students, professional companies, quite literally all over the world, because there are just so many sensible choices to be, to be made. And it's, it's intriguing, I think, perhaps Mary Catherine would agree, it's intriguing to sort through what those choices are. 
um, to see different choices unfold before your eyes as a director, when an actor suddenly will emphasize a word that, that had not stuck out to you before. And my goodness, all of a sudden that just opens up the meaning of that, of that speech or gives, um, gives that, that action. So my friendly assistant Maddie will now let you see exactly what it is that we're going to maybe, there it is, um, do this evening. We have just finished talking about, about Will. By the way, in three more days, it's his birthday, death day. May we all celebrate um, the play as you like it in this case and, um, and us, what our uh, experience has been, is with, with this play. There will be a synopsis that will be delivered courtesy of a film clip. This will be about the, um, the 2019 uh, Royal Shakespeare Company production. Then um, I will talk just very briefly about sources and the production uh, history and then get into more of choices that have been made for specific uh, productions of As You Like It over the years of the director, of the designers. And when we get to the one that says of the actors, I have three different clips that, um, that we will be showing that come from, uh, all of them are from Act 3, Scene 2, starting with line 346. If you have a play handy and you want to, um, you want to follow along, um, but it might actually even be better if you just soak it in because these are three very different uh, renditions of exactly the same chunk of text. And I think they will give us some good discussion. So on to the synopsis. In the story of As You Like It, Duke Senior has been forced into exile by his brother, Duke Frederick, from the court. And he's been followed into the Forest of Arden by a band of faithful lords. The court is in a very fragile state, and Rosalind, Duke Senior's daughter, has been kept there as a companion to Celia, Duke Frederick's daughter. Orlando de Bois, the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois, has also been kept in a state of poverty by his eldest brother, Oliver. And in a state of desperation, he decides to go to the court and fight Charles the Wrestler. When he arrives at the court, he unexpectedly meets Rosalind, who gives him a brand new motivation to win the fight against Charles, which surprises everybody. Threatened by Rosalind's presence and power, Duke Frederick banishes Rosalind, and Celia, refusing to be parted from her best friend, decides to go with her. Now, for safety reasons, they decide to disguise themselves in the forest. So Rosalind as the boy Ganymede, and Celia as Aliena. They also very cleverly manage to persuade the fool Touchstone to join them. On hearing of a plot by his brother Oliver to kill him, Orlando flees to the forest of Arden, taking old faithful Adam with him, also going to seek refuge with the exiled Duke. Posting love poems in the forest, Orlando encounters Rosalind disguised as Ganymede. Now Rosalind is quite suspicious of Orlando's lovesick state and so suggests to him that he should come every day to woo Rosalind in the disguise of Ganymede. Love is blossoming elsewhere in the forest also. The shepherdess Sylvia suffers unrequited love for Phoebe and the fool Touchstone has decided to pursue the goat herd Audrey. So Oliver, sent into the forest to find and kill his brother, actually ends up having his life saved by Orlando. He feels enormous remorse and falls in love with Aliena. Frustrated by his love for Rosalind, Orlando decides he can no longer play Ganymede's game. And so Ganymede promises to conjure the real Rosalind and that all the lovers 
will finally be wet. So even if you have never seen a production of As You Like It, and I think we all have, um, but even if you have never read the play, I think that director Kimberly Sykes gives a, a pretty entertaining um, synopsis of a really convoluted story. Um, lots of, of subplots, um, whole different casts of characters. Uh, many times there will be doubling by the actors. And so that tends to confuse things even further, but it is usually a delightful kind of, of a confusion. Shakespeare sources for this play, and I am, um, I am assuming that um, you learned perhaps way back in high school that there are very few of Shakespeare's plays for which he was the um, originator of the story. Almost all of his plays uh, were, were found um, the basic storyline someplace else. And for As You Like It, it was found in a prose piece by author Thomas Lodge, a pastoral romance called Rosalind, first published in 1590. Shakespeare's characters do not face as many hardships as Thomas Lodge's did. And, um, and Shakespeare has added the clowns touchstone. And now here's the first thing. Some productions will call him Jake, please. Some productions will call him Jake's. As I always said to my students at Callaway, every time we studied this, this play or came upon a scene, um, as long as you are consistent within the given production with regard to a pronunciation, you are good to go. So because I first learned from Dr. Hallio that this character should be called Jayquees, and indeed, Dr. Hallio went so far as to say that when another character whose name was spelled exactly the same, but is the third brother of, um, of Orlando and Oliver shows up, that you can give the other pronunciation to that character if you wanna make a differentiation. So he called that brother Jake's and called the uh, clown character Jake Lee's. So that's what I will probably do, but that is not set in stone anywhere. Where Lodge's story was set was in Ardennes, France, which, um, we're pretty sure that, that Shakespeare also intended for that court scene to be set in Ardennes, France, because we have Amiens, which is a, a French name. And just there are several different lines that refer to, uh, to the French court or can easily be construed as referring to the French court. But during Shakespeare's time, um, it is likely that most people in the audience would think that the it was not in France, but rather the Arden that is in Warwickshire that was being referred to in this play. As far as its history is concerned, the first printing of it, to our knowledge, is in the first folio in 1623. There are no surviving quarto versions that have shown up um, so far, and um, yet we know that it was written uh, and performed at the New Globe when it was first opened in 1599. So it was around and being, being played for a good number of, of years. Now, Directors have, um, have a lot of choices to make. And unless it is, and I've been reading about this just lately, that there are some Shakespeare troops of, of actors, professional troops that have decided in essence 
to go directorless. In fact, the Pennsylvania Shakespeare Festival does one play every year in what they term original practice. There were not directors, of course, in, in Shakespeare's time. Um, I guess you really didn't even need a director. You had yourself a playwright. You had the playwright who was who was right there if any questions arose with regard to, to the text. And so many things were, were just um, so apparent um, from, from the text itself. Um, but Pennsylvania Shakespeare Festival brings together a bunch of, of actors, gives them a script, and tells them you may you may have at it. Just rehearse, go costume yourselves, go um, get the props that that you need, and uh, and they do it in a in a black box theater, and um, and and it's kind of it's kind of fun. I have also read absolutely scathing reviews of some plays in in England which were done in a directorless kind of a way. So I, I really think that we are in no danger of losing the position of director at this point in, um, in theater history. Now, there are a number of um, choices that were made by the directors of the 2019 production that was done at the Globe. The directors were Faraday uh, Holmes and Ellie Weil. And if my assistant would queue up the trailer, we will see that. Now, this was um, presented in, in 2018, um, but then again in 2019. And the reviews that I read from 2018, all I can think is that they must have made lots of changes um, before they opened up their season in 2019, because all of the things that were being slammed by the reviewers from the 18 production I saw none of with my, with my very own eyes. Choices that were made by the directors was for this play to be set in, in the Caribbean. Director choice was made about including two actors who used British Sign Language for, for their, their lines. Now, by 2019, they had worked with the text, and I'm not sure who the they is, whether it was the actors themselves, the scholars, the text coach. I'm going to think that it might have been the text coach <laughs> um, to put, to reattribute spoken lines of Celia, who is a deaf mute. Um, that role was played by an actor whose name is Nadia Nadaraja. And she was 
I thought she was just amazing in her use of facial expression to convey exact, she was, she was the, the brown-skinned woman whose face was very animated in the piece that, that you just saw. And lines that were important for the audience to hear spoken were reattributed to either Rosalind or, or Touchstone, whoever it was who was interacting with her at the time, so that none of the meaning to my ears, to my sensibility, um, was lost in this regard. Jayquees likewise uh, used British Sign Language. Now that role was played by Sophie, what is Sophie's last name? I have my, Sophie Stone. Um, she speaks. Her speech does not sound like a hearing person's speech. Nevertheless, it is, um, it's really quite mesmerizing to listen to. And obviously there's another opinion that I'm laying in here. Someone standing next to me um, might, have had, might have had a very different opinion, but to my ear, I really enjoyed listening to, to Sophie Stone's voice, especially when she did the seven ages of man speech. Um, and with all of the signing that just really enhanced the meaning behind those words. Now, the bit, the directorial choice that took me probably five minutes to get into was the gender flipping because a very tall, very thin, male actor played Rosalind and a very short and quite slight framed woman played Orlando. And it took me a minute, it, it did, to, to be able to wrap my mind around that. Um, I think that that one of the, the themes of As You Like It certainly is um, what we today are calling gender fluidity, the way in which, well, a male human being was playing a female character, Rosalind, who went into the forest of Arden and became a male character, and um, trying to entice the love of her life, Orlando, to, um, to fall in love with, with her, fall out of love, I should say, with, um, with her. And so what is it that we are, that we are seeing here? with regard to gender and does it does it matter and and these actors again to to my taste were so skillful that that the original gender um whatever that might be of of these human beings who were playing these roles became irrelevant although i will tell you that there was a whole lot of, of visual humor that came again and again in the size disparity between Rosalind being so much taller and just bigger than, um, than Orlando was. Um, and directorial choice also uh, extends to casting. There was a production that featured David Tennant in the role of, of Touchstone. There, there he is in, on the, the right-hand side of your screen. The director was Stephen Pimlott and um, he was 25 years old. This, it was his first season with the Royal Shakespeare Company. He had just um, finished up rehearsing Glass Menagerie and he thought that he was going into the studio to read for the role of Orlando. 
um, he was cast instead as Touchstone from a book that uh, is edited by Robert Smallwood. There are a number of, um, of different um, of different volumes to it. It's called Players of Shakespeare. And they are fairly brief essays of how an actor comes to find the character that they are playing. This is what David Tennant had to say about this. And you'll see how the director works in here. To start with, he says, I reread the play. It struck me how episodic it all is, how many different stories are going on at the same time, and yet how little actually happened. It seems to be different to any other Shakespeare play I had read with a pace and a charm and a quirkiness, which I imagined would be hard to get the measure of. It has one monster part, Rosalind, the heroine, and a very full and varied supporting cast, each of whom seems to fulfill a very definite role. Orlando is the lover, Celia the friend, Duke Frederick the bad guy, Jake Lee's the contrast, Sylvia and Phoebe the complimentary subplot, and Touchstone the comedian. Ah, there's the rub. I could see that Touchstone was supposed to be funny in terms of the structure of the play, the tone of his scenes, and the fact that everyone keeps going on about how hilarious he is, and yet I could find nothing in the part to make me even smile. Through the rest of the play, I found a lot of genuinely funny exchanges. Rosalind was witty, Celia sported a fine line in caustic sarcasm, and Jake Lee's melancholy cynicism gave him some wonderful put downs. But all Touchstone seemed to have was very long speeches, heavy with obscure double entendre and long tracks of cool philosophy, but nothing obviously funny. So how did he find his funny? The director, Stephen Penlott, talked it through with him, asking the first important question, is he a clown? Or is he a natural? And Penlott worked, worked it through with, um, with David until he came to the conclusion that, that uh, Touchdown was just too logical, too satirical to be accidental. So the text, then the costume, and then the voice, including his own Scottish accent, along with his talent for doing voices, for mimicking things, turned this into a fantastic, according to all of the, all of the reviews, um, enactment of the role of Touchstone. Designers. Tremendous. Oh, it's amazing. I thought it was great. I thought it was visually absolutely stunning. I'd say it's got a bit of everything. So it's a, a bit of romance, a bit of rivalry. I really particularly like the strong female lead. I love the characters. It's for everyone. I think it's for everyone. Just a good evening a out. A good evening really. out. Yeah. The costumes, the set. It was wonderful. First of all, the acting was brilliant. And like, I came all the way from the United States to see something like this. It was a newcomer. I was just blown away by it all. It's really good. Very vibrant and lively and yeah. funny. Good night out, great fun. It's incredible, incredible. They've got to come and see it to experience it. Plunge in, immerse yourself, get the ticket. It's a really fun play um, and you should go check it out. Yeah. Out of 10, 10. <laughs> So this was the 2019 summer production of As You Like It at the main stage of the Royal Shakespeare Theater. They have um, fairly recently, I think it was 2013, that they finished a redo of, um, of that theater. And it now has, uh, has a thrust stage in it. Um, similar to the Swan Theater there, but of course, much, much larger. Now, what the designers did with As You Like It was to turn the whole space into the Forest of Arden with green lights and vines that were growing throughout the production so that by the time you got to the end, 
where that humongous puppet of Hyman came um, up from, from the stage, um, you, you were immersed in, um, in the forest of Arden. Um, there was a lot of gender bending in, in this particular production as well. And it was the Audrey who was a British Sign Language user in, in this production. And um, now I saw this with my Shakespeare friends and we just puzzled and puzzled over that after we came back to, to the house that night because it seemed as though um, what had been done at the Globe, although I hadn't seen the Globe yet, so I didn't know that that was gonna happen there, but, but what was happening in Stratford was that there, there was no reattribution of her spoken lines and Audrey is such a delicious role to play. It, it's, it is one of the most hilarious characters in this pretty funny play. And to have all of her lines removed, I, I miss them. Let me just put it that way. I very much um, miss them. So we get to, um, we get to actors and, and how they influence um, the, the play. And this is, um, well, I'm gonna show you three different slices of three different films, all doing act three, scene two, starting, we hope, <laughs> with line 346, different productions. This first one is a 2006 production that was done for HBO and BBC. Kenneth Branagh was the director. You will see Bryce Dallas Howard. If she looks like Ron Howard, that is because she is his daughter. David uh, yep, I can never say the man's name correctly without really trying hard. Ayelowo, did I say it? I don't know. Um, and Celia is Romola Garai, but you really cannot, um, Celia is there. Let me just say that because I don't think you're going to see her in this scene slice. Now, this is where we're gonna play this. And while you're watching, I am going to ask you to think about any of these things, if you can. What is it about this production, this film that captured your attention? Does it seem to be a director, designer, or actor choice? And did it enhance or deter from your understanding of the story? Go, Maddie. There is a man haunts the forest that abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs odes upon hawthorns and elegies on brambles, or forsooth, deifying the name of Rosalind. <laughs> if I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love-shaked. There is none of my uncle's marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I am sure you are not prisoner. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. Then your hose should be ungartered, your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrements as loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. Fair youth. I would I could make thee believe I love. Me believe it? You may soon make her that you love believe it. I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he 
<laughs> that unfortunate he. But are you so much in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness. And I tell you deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. Yet I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one. And in this manner, he was to imagine me, his love, his mistress, and I set him every day to woo me. <laughs> <laughs> At which time would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve, be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something, and for no passion truly anything, as boys and women are for the most part cattle of this colour, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him, that I drave my suitor from his mad humour of love to a living humour of madness. Which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook, merely monastic. And thus I cured him. And this way will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you if you would but call me Rosalind and come every day and woo me. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. Will you? With all my heart, good youth. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. So, if Jen is there, maybe she can pull up somebody who has something to say. There she is. Hi. Uh, I think most people know how to um, unmute themselves. So please uh, jump in at this point if you have any comments. I have a, a comment. Uh, the um, the use of one camera spinning around. It was a little distracting at first, but actually I, I decided I liked it. It really showed uh, different sides of the, the actors, of course. And I, I, it sort of, I thought it was nice in the, in the setting. I didn't think the setting was distracting. It was out in the wilderness, or not the wilderness, but in a nice wooded area. I thought it was nice. Yeah. Can I do it now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I like Bryce Dallas Howard, but I think um, her acting was showing there. So that, that would be the only acting note that I'd have. I thought David, um, wh whose last name I have trouble with as well, uh, <laughs> was excellent. Um, and he knew how to do stillness. Uh, Bryce was always going like this and trying hard to be energetic and it, and it kind of showed. Um, the other thing that's a director's note is um, he was doing, I like Kenneth Branagh, but he's doing this West Wing thing where we have to move when we're talking and sometimes the text gets lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also doesn't make sense. Where are you going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless it's, oh, that's it. <laughs> All right, shall we watch the next one, which, which is an, another film, but it is a film of a staged performance. So there, you won't get any of the fancy um, camera work, Alan, but well, you'll see what you'll get. This is the 2011 Michael Boyd Royal Shakespeare production.
there is a man haunts our forest that abuses our young plants with carving. Rosalind, on every bark, hangs odes upon hawthorns, elegies upon brambles, all forsooth deifying the name of Rosalind. Whew, if I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love-shaked. I pray you, tell me your remedy. Well, there are none of my uncle's marks upon you. Well, he taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I'm sure you're not prisoner. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. But I'll pardon you for that. Then your sleeve should be unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrements, as loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. Fair youth, I would I could make thee believe. I love. Me believe it. You may soon make her that you love believe it. Oh, which I warrant she is apter to do than to confess she does. But in good sooth, are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein this Rosalind is so admired? I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate he. And are you so in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness, and I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any, sir? Yes, one, and in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his mistress. <laughs> and I set him every day to woo me. At which time would I be, but a moonish youth, grieve, be effeminate changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something, and for no passion truly anything, as women are most part cattle of this colour, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him, that I drove my suitor from his mad humour of love into a living humour of madness which was to forswear the full stream of the world and live in a nook, merely monastic. And thus I cured him. And thus will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart. There will not be a spot of love in it. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you. If you would but call me Rosalind. And I should have said beforehand that the role of Rosalind was played by Katie Stevens. Orlando was John Joe O'Neill. And Celia, who was at least seen in the background there with no lines, was Mariah Gale. So what do you think? Catherine. <laughs> I love doing this. I'm sorry, watching it. Uh, yeah. But uh, I mean, I love this scene with the way they did it. They made an argument of it. Whereas the first scene was kind of a pastoral vocation more. Um, this was an argument that softened. They both had a wide range and they, they broke the rules about the text in just the right way, you know, and not always when, when there's a pause, taking that pause. I, I love this one. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Were you distracted at all, anybody, by the painted on beard and mustache on, um, on Katie's face? It's interesting, I, I saw this in person when it was in New York City and, um, and it, it was fine to me on the stage but in this this close-up i i just couldn't stop focusing on what looked to me like like a fake um representation i i didn't find that um a problematic at all i also was in the i love this how this scene was played i thought the pausing the the way they interacted, um, the magnetism that was mm -hmm. was under not, underlying it was um, 
really masterful. I thought, and I, you know, the, the mustache, you know, was, uh, it didn't bother me a bit, uh, it, but I, I thought it was um, mesmerizing. I liked it. I always like to find a place where Rosalind remembers that she's a man and tries to act a bit more mannish. And I think I saw that there where she actually kind of, it was, it was fleeting, but she lowered her voice. Mm -hmm. um, and it, not everybody gets it, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's real. Yeah. All right, ready for the last one. This is Pippa Nixon, Alex Waldman, and Joanna Horton. There is a man haunts the forest, abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs odes upon hawthorns and elegies on brambles, all forsooth deifying the name of Rosalind. If I could meet that fancy monger. <laughs> I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love-shaked. I pray you, tell me your remedy. There's none of my uncle's marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love. In which cage of rushes, I am sure you are not prisoner. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. But, but I, I pardon you for that. For simply your having in beard is a younger brother's revenue. Then your hose should be unguarded, your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You're rather point device in your accoutrements, as loving yourself and seeming the lover of any other. Fair youth. I would I could make me believe I love. Me believe it? You may as soon make her that you love believe it, which I warrant. She is apter to do than confess she does. That is one of the points in the which women still give the lie to their consciences. But in good sooth, are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein the name of Rosalind is so admired? I swear to thee, you, by the white hand of Rosalind, Rosalind. I am that he. That unfortunate he. <laughs> but are you so much in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness. And I tell you, deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they're not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. Yet I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any son? Yes, one, and in this manner. He was to imagine me, his love, his mistress, and I set him every day to woo me, at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something and for no passion truly anything, as boys and women are, for the most part, cattle of this colour. 
But now, like him. Now, loathe him. Then, entertain him. Forswear him. Now, weep for him. Then, spit at him. That I drave my suitor from his mad humour of love to a living humour of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook merely monastic. And thus I cured him. And this way will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall not be one spot of love in it. <laughs> I would not be cured, Ute. I would cure you if you would but call me Rosalind and come every day to my cot and woo me. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. Go with me to it, and I'll show it to you. And by the way, you should tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, good youth. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? comments I loved her facial expressions <laughs> fabulous um, it just brought depth to the role at times her dialogue was so quick that I lost some of it maybe that's my senior hearing I have no idea <laughs> but um, fabulous again the um, synergy the the uh, magnetism between the two, lovely, lovely, which is so important in this, in this scene. Uh, I'm not sure if I can be heard. You can. There? Yes. Um, I, um, I thought this one was absolutely charming. The, um, I, it's, she plays it beautifully, right on the edge of being totally feminine to just a young guy talking to his friend. I, it's just, I, th I thought it was a really nicely done piece. I have a couple of questions though that don't necessarily relate directly to this, um, if I may. I, I was wondering what, um, what you felt, the, the gender switching, um, what that gave to the interpretation of the characters and or the play. In the in the earlier um, things that I was referring to. Mm -hmm. Okay, can we hold off on that until Absolutely. we get the, the some other comments? I think there were other people who had things to say about about A specific that. piece. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. I, when we get to when we ha we can do questions, I have uh, I have another one as well. So, okay. thank you. Love this one. I thought the um, choice of smoking was really good in it because it gave them kind of something coy to play with back and forth, um, and I thought that really really worked well, and um, just. The way the camera focused on them, it was um, very tight, and therefore her facial expressions made more made more sense. You know, they were bigger and than than the other interpretations. I, I just love this one. I was I was totally drawn into this one. I'd like to say that I, I agree with Jill. I was totally drawn into it, even though I knew exactly what was going to happen and what was going to be said. I was really into it. I felt um, they portrayed the emotions more realistically. And it was more about 
uh, bringing you into the story than it was acting it out. And I thought it, it seemed more realistic. Of course, the setting had something to do with it. It didn't bother me at all that it, it, that's what it was. Mary Catherine. Yeah. I, I saw Cecilia there. Did she have something yeah, to say? Yeah. Can you hear me? I, I, um, this was the one where I sensed um, the danger of Orlando falling in love with, um, mm -hmm. yes. with Ganymede <laughs> and, um, and all that and, and the tension. And I thought that was, uh, that was missing from the other ones. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, um, you know, she's slipping up a bit, uh, but she's still supposed to be a guy. And he's starting to think she's, he's pretty cute. So I, I love that. Later in this production, there, there is a bit where, um, where he is very much falling for, for her in every sense of the word and suddenly has the horrific realization that, that this is a male not a female and and the look of of surprise almost horror on on his face is um is a moment yeah exactly what i was going to say <laughs> yeah the, because you almost wanted to see it there because she won him over with that wrestling match and and it got physical and there was some attraction uh, but if it, it did happen later, I think I saw that production. Mm -hmm. I still can never figure out why Rosalind, you must know this, Linda, why Rosalind uh, is doing this. You know, Orlando's in the woods, she's in the woods, hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the only answer is because where would the story be without it? <laughs> <laughs> A sponsorship thing and they needed a three hour play. <laughs> I think uh, this um, production is much more relatable. Also, I think um, uh, kids, this, this uh, young children or young kids now, if they saw this production would really relate to the story. The way it was acted and the interaction, I I just think uh, it would it the kids today would really relate to this this the delivery. Yeah, I think you're right. Now, one thing I can assure you is that other than maybe two minutes worth of a demonstration of the uh, style of performing Shakespeare that was declamatory um, back you know, close to a century ago, uh, that way of doing Shakespeare is, is not something that, well, perhaps that any of us could abide today, but especially the younger people will call that out immediately. Um, Olivier being Henry V. I did I did show a film slice of that to uh, to my high school students when we were studying that play, and they were like just about falling out of their chairs laughing. And they couldn't believe that any actors ever could would have been believed in speaking lines in that in that fashion. But that was that that was considered excellent acting in those days. <laughs> That is the way it was taught too. It was interesting in that last version how intimate the camera was, how closely it was cropped on the actors. And I was at how the camera would change focus to, it, it almost seemed a couple of times like they were almost having asides and making eye contact with the camera coyly. And it was, it was also, I, I was wondering as I was, watching that there was such intimacy in the scene and such quietness as far as their voice that I was wondering you know the what what it would have been live on stage and how they would have changed what they were doing for a live audience as opposed to a film audience 
in that particular, in that third scene in particular? Yeah, that's a really good question and one to which I do not know the answer. I, I do know because we were lucky enough to be permitted to be in the main stage theater when um, cameras were getting set up to film uh, the 2019 RSC production of Measure for Measure. And that the theater was indeed going to be, to be empty. I think that that is the way the RSC always does it. Whereas the Globe always films to a house that is, that is filled with humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we were just really lucky. We had to, of course, promise not to say a word or sneeze or cough or anything. It wasn't that filming was going on. It's just that the technicians were, were very intense in getting everything all set up for what was going to be the afternoon's worth of filming of that, of that production. But it's very different when you see a film of an actual play where they're filming the production. And this last one we saw was just for film. Um, and it was beautiful, but we can't do that on stage. We have, we can try to get the tension mm -hmm. um, and try and, and get that spark of electricity, but you have to reach the audience a different way. It's always a puzzle. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no further comments about, about this, um, we can go into the the questions, Tanya's and whatever ones happen to be in the chat. But first, I need to be sure to say to check out the choices that will be indeed made by Mary Catherine Kelly for the upcoming production of As You Like It happening sometime in 2021, we hope. Is that not a true thing, Mary Catherine? Unmuted. Um, you want me to show my hand now? No, you do not need to show your hand now. We're yeah. just all very hopeful that yeah. a, an honest to goodness live production of this right. take place. Well, I am hopeful too, and we are proceeding with that in mind. Um, so, I mean, I have always found that uh, once I have my cast together, um, that's when I make a lot of the decisions because this touchstone is, you know, a tall, skinny kid or a fat, older guy. And there's a whole different way of playing things mm -hmm. so, with all the characters. Um, I mean, I think you have to ground it with your uh, Rosalind and Celia and, and Orlando, um, but the rest, it's anybody's game. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> so we're hoping to do it in September. Well, we look forward to it. Speaking for all of us. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. all are. So Tanya, to go yeah. back to your, your question, I think that um, this is totally my opinion. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. I think that we saw gender bending both at the Globe and at the RSC in the summer of 2019 because it was a hot topic. And it, it almost felt to me in both productions kind of like a gimmick, not at all like the original practice um, Globe productions that that were prevalent when the Globe first opened and Mark Rylance was the artistic director. It was all about original practice and just wanting to see what that space, what the Globe itself would do mm -hmm. to the telling of the story, to the actors' voices. Um, the two times that I studied at the Globe, I cannot begin to tell you the effect that the acoustics in that space, that round space with all of that wood and all of the sound bouncing right back to you does to a performance. I mean, I'm not a performer, I'm an English teacher, a retired English teacher, but being on that stage speaking lines, and yes, they really had us do that, albeit at midnight after the shows were done for the day, is um, 
is an experience like nothing else I have have ever known. Um, and so Mark Rylance, when the Globe first opened, very much wanted almost like a theatrical archaeologist, wanted to find out what following original practice would do for productions, for the actors, um, for the audience. And, um, and so there were all male casts, just like there were back in Shakespeare's day. Um, I saw Mark Rylance playing Cleopatra in the summer of 99 in one of those all male casts. And I saw clips of that. He was just, he was perfect. He was perfect. And there, there was not a second that that gender even entered my mind. This in the summer of 2019, gender, gender did enter my mind. Mm -hmm. And um, and yes, the actors were good enough that I could that I could and did set it aside after the first five minutes or so. But I, I really think that it was it a it gimmick. Was a gimmick. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Um, the other question I had was, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I, I'm never sure. I always have trouble with the audio. Um, you several times mentioned um, actors doing British uh, sign language. And I know uh, from years ago, British sign is totally different from American sign and certainly from, uh, from signed English. Did that make a difference to you or was it just that they were doing sign? Um, it did not make a difference to me, to me personally at all. The okay. only bit of sign language that I know is American sign language and it's because my youngest granddaughter was born with Down syndrome and so she and I learned American Sign Language together during lunch every day wow. um, when I got to to play with her when she <laughs> was pretty much brand new. So I know very little about, about any kind of sign language. And my understanding came from, um, in the case of the Globe production, the reattribution of the, of the spoken lines to other characters so that um, the sense of the story carried forward. Right. Okay. Um, I just, I have, perhaps I'll, I'll tell you another time, but um, I have a, a small um, remark about that from, uh, that is not Shakespeare, but it is uh, dealing with sign on stage, actually for a musical. <laughs> amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, I was just curious because I'd, I'd never heard, um, uh, of course, it makes absolute sense because you were seeing things in uh, in England uh, for them to do British signs. So interesting. Okay, thank you. Certainly. And thank you very much for doing this. Oh, it was it was my pleasure, and I thank granddaughter Maddie, who without whom this would not have been possible. Because yeah, hi Maddie. Thank I you. Just, uh, hi. Hello. <laughs> this this has been recorded, hasn't it? Yes, it's it's being recorded. Would it be on the website? Uh, yes. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Thanks, Jen. Okay. In a few in a few days. All right. Okay. Thank you. And um, it does not Jen, as though there are any other questions that um, have shown up in in the chat. So I don't see any in the chat, but okay. I do want to point out that um, Maddie has placed the references um, to the lecture or discussion tonight that Linda has compiled. Um, and those are in the chat box for you to download if you all would be interested in doing that. Um, so one more round, are there any further questions that we might have missed before we close for the evening? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been really wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda. My pleasure. It was delightful. Any excuse to talk about Shakespeare? <laughs> I find about George Floyd, what Rachel has to say. We hope, we hope you can do it again sometime. Yes, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay.
Linda, thank, thank you so much. This was really, um, this was really great for me. This was really cathartic because <laughs> after 20 years of doing Shakespeare here in Arden, I often just don't even, I mean, it was like a, a huge passion all year long. And I often uh, just don't want to have anything to do with it. I really, it's just like, no, count me, leave me out. I don't want to know. Um, and, and I did come over just with my friend Barbara here. And um, I really, really enjoyed it. And um, it just reminded me of, uh, of all the passion and, and the, the fun, fun and the fun, not just the exhaustion, but the fun. <laughs> and um, and thank, thank you so much. Personally, thank you. Certainly. Thank you, everyone. Everybody Thank have you. a good night. Thank Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Those of you who are traveling, safe travels. <laughs> <laughs>